Lesson 4 has us completing element A for standard 7. We're focusing on the 1906 Atlanta riot, the Leo Frank case, and the county unit system. While you watch the video, you should be completing your tip chart and thinking about your response to the key question, what do the 1906 Atlanta race riot and the Leo Frank case have in common? Atlanta has traditionally been viewed as a progressive southern city whose relatively tolerant racial policies allowed for the rise of many successful African-American social leaders, institutions of higher education, and African-American businesses. However, there's one tragic event in Atlanta's history that tarnished this reputation. It's the 1906 Atlanta race riot, which resulted in the death of at least 25 people. The immediate spark for this two-day riot was a series of newspaper articles that alleged that, uh, that black men had been attacking white women. These articles proved to be untrue. However, um, there were many other deep-seated causes of the riot. Some of these included the large number of unemployed and frustrated white men who viewed African Americans as threats to jobs and the social order. There were also many whites that were jealous of successful African-American business leaders such as Alonzo Herndon. Alonzo Herndon owned a barbershop that was sometimes called the Crystal Palace. And unfortunately, it was one of the first businesses targeted by the white mob. Additionally, Hoke Smith and Cl Clark Howell were both running for governor of Georgia at this time. And they made matters worse by basing their campaigns on a platform of white supremacy, which caused more anger between these groups. On the morning of the riot, there were four articles that were published about the assaults on white women, and a group of mostly unemployed white men and boys gathered in downtown Atlanta seeking revenge for these false attacks. Even though city officials tried to calm the mob, the group of men began attacking any black person that they saw. They traveled into the black business district and killed two barbers and beat several men to death on streetcars. Due to all the violence, the Georgia militia was called into the city, and in turn, African Americans began to arm them themselves and in some cases started fighting off their attackers. Despite these efforts, there was sporadic fighting that occurred throughout the next day. For Atlanta itself, the riot caused a lot of unwanted negative attention throughout the country and throughout the world. Atlanta had been called the jewel of the New South. So to try to end the riot, Atlanta business leaders, both black and white, quickly came together to restore order. This committee um, was historic in itself because these groups rarely met together in the South. The end result led to deeper segregation in the city and more of an economic divide between the African-American social elite and lower class. It also proved for many that uh, Booker T. Washington's views concerning the use of hard work and economic accomplishment as a means for African American equality would not work in the South and that there needed to be a more direct approach for gaining civil rights. Another racially charged event during the New South period was the murder of Mary Fagan and the Leo Frank case. This time, a Jewish man from New York, who was the manager of the National Pencil Company, Leo Frank, was accused of murdering 13-year-old Mary Fagan, an employee of the pencil factory. Frank's appeals made it all the way to the Supreme Court, and the, his court case and his tragic lynching made national headlines. On April 26, 1913, Mary Fagan went to the pencil factory to collect her her dollar and 20 cent paycheck for a 12 hour work week. Fagan was the child of, a mi of migrant farmers who, like many poor farmers, had moved to Atlanta to improve their financial prospects. Fagan received her pay from her supervisor, Leo Frank, and then left. She never returned home, and later that evening, her beaten body was found in the basement of the factory. When the newspapers reported that they had, had found her and suggested that she had also been sexually assaulted, the, pu the public demanded justice. From the start, 
there were three suspects in the case. One was the night watchman who found the body. The second was Jim Conley, the factory's janitor, who was arrested after being seen washing red stains from his shirt. And the third was Leo Frank. There was evidence both for and against Frank's innocence. Frank appeared extremely nervous when the police came to his house for questioning, though some reports have stated that that was just part of his personality. He claimed to have stayed at the office for at least 20 minutes after Fagan left, but another employee who came to the office for her pay claimed that, that he was not in his office during that period of time. Finally, the night watchman claimed that Frank called him that evening asking if everything was okay. According to the watchman, this was the only time that Frank had ever done this. However, Jim Conley was also a strong suspect. Along with the blood-stained white shirt, he also gave police detectives four different affidavits about how he had helped Frank get rid of the body. Some have argued that due to the, rac the racial prejudices of the time, the police could not believe that the African-American Conley had the capacity to develop the story on his own and promised him immunity for testifying against Frank. During this trial, Conley proved to be invaluable to the prosecution, which means he was very important. Frank's lawyers could not break Conley's testimony and his stories about Frank's illicit affairs and harassment of the young white Southern female employees agitated an already hostile public and the jury who already believed that Frank was guilty of the murder. Frank was convicted of killing Mary Fagan and was sentenced to death. Upon his conviction, many Jewish groups both from both the North and the South began funding Frank's appeals. In turn, Tom Watson began an anti-Semitic campaign against Leo Frank and Northern Jewish interest in his newspaper and magazine. After several appeals, Frank did not receive a pardon. However, one of the prosecuting attorneys, William Smith, who helped convict Frank and defend Conley, began to believe in Frank's innocence and conducted his own investigation of the case. With his work, he was able to convince Governor John Slayton to look, to look into reducing Frank's sentence to life in prison in the hopes that enough evidence could be found that would result in a full pardon. Slayton, after conducting an investigation on his own, agreed that Frank was innocent, and going against public opinion, he reduced Frank's sentence to life in prison. This action resulted in public protest, and Slayton, who had been a popular governor, had to declare martial law. At the end of his term, he left Georgia in secret and did not return for most of the decade. Due to their fear that Frank would eventually be released, some community members from Marietta, um, which was Mary Fagan's hometown, drove to Milledgeville, Milledgeville, which is where Frank was being held in prison. They managed to walk into the state prison, remove Frank, and drive him back up to Marietta. This group called themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan. Once they got him back to Marietta, they lynched him. Later, residents posed for photographs next to his body, and these photographs in the form of postcards were sold as souvenirs. In 1986, primarily due to the testimony of Alonzo Mann, the Georgia State Board of Pardons finally pardoned Leo Frank. Alonzo Mann claimed that as a boy, he saw Jim Conley carrying Mary Fagan's body, and when discovered, Conley threatened to kill him if he said anything. So the reason we look at this case is that it displays deeper issues that were held by white Georgians during the New South period. Many poor Georgians were resentful of big businesses, especially those that represented Northern interests and were ran by Northern transplants like Leo Frank. There was also an underlying hatred of immigrants, Jews, and Catholics in the Deep South during this time period. This hatred erupted in the Frank case and was fueled by Tom Watson's propaganda. Soon after, members of the Knights of Mary Fagan formed the second incarnation of the KKK. The county unit system. Simply put, the county unit system was instituted in 1917. It gave more power to rural, less populated counties than to the urban counties. 
due to the fact that Georgia was solidly dem a, a solid Democratic state, candidates who won the primary were guaranteed to win the election. Under the system, counties were divided into three categories and given a specific number of unit votes. Urban counties were given six votes, town counties were given four votes, and rural counties were given two votes. However, under this system, there were eight urban counties with 48 votes, 30 town counties with 120 votes, and 121 rural counties with 242 votes. So what this means is when rural counties voted as a block, they had much more power than the more populous urban centers. Though obviously going against the concept of one man, one vote, this system lasted for almost 50 years. This system, along with the white primary, was one of the ways that was used to limit the voting power of African Americans. For more information on each of these three topics, you can check out the links. I've posted them to Google Classroom. So now that we're through with Lessons 1 through 4, this completes Element A of Standard 7. You need to go to Google Classroom and complete the Key Questions task.